Hello everyone, I'm Chuck Araftic and welcome to my basement. Today I'd like to show you what's occupied my spare time for the past 20 years and probably for the next 20 also. With my layout, I've been trying to capture the excitement and romance of robust Class I American railroading in the mid-20th century and perhaps also capture some childhood memories. Here in my basement, it's always a sunny June day uh, circa 1951, and I'm a little kid once again. Down here in my Boston and Albany division of the New York Central System, traffic is heavy in the early 50s, and both passenger and freight, and uh, it's all running along the B&A's two-track mainline. As you may know, the, the, the Boston and Albany was uh, acquired and absorbed into the New York Central System around 1900, and uh, the Boston community was outraged. You can imagine if the Yankees had bought the Red Sox. Well, to sort of uh, smooth things over, the New York Central wisely decided that they were going to uh, maintain the B&A lettering and logos on all motive power equipment, uh, overpasses, timetables, menus, and so on. Uh, until after World War II. By the 1948-51 to 51 era that I model, the signs and logos were fading, sleek New York Central diesels were arriving, and by the end of World War II, I think the Fuhrer had died down. I modeled the western portion of the Boston and Albany, from Albany to the Berkshire Hills. When I started, I was striving to try to get as historically accurate a representation of that era as I could, but as time went by I realized that I needed to fudge a few things, some scenery, some motive power, and I can talk about that as we go along. Twenty years ago, when I started this, uh, I began by preparing the basement. I renovated everything, code compliant, electrical work, heating, carpeting, and so on, and the, one of the first things I did was to create, as you can see here, um, these valences and fascias in dark green. I wanted the layout to appear as if it were sort of a long, continuous diorama, rather than just a tabletop kind of railroad. At this point, I've pretty much completed phase one, and I'll be starting on phase two later this year. Phase one consists of this room here, which we're going to be looking at up to this point. Phase two will be the adjoining room, which will almost double the size of, of the layout. Some of the more detailed points I probably should make is the minimum radius is about 29 inches in a couple of places. The maximum grade is about 2.1%. The layout is about, uh, on the average, about uh, 54 inches high. It goes from about 54 to about 60, and uh, pretty much at eye level. If I had to do something over again, I'd probably lower that just a little bit. I find that my wife other people are a lot shorter than I am, so it, uh, they have a little trouble. That's why I have a number of stools sitting around the layout. One thing I think is important here to point out is I've used a modular approach. Even though I've been working on this for 20 years, I always have assumed that maybe someday we might want to move or, for whatever reason, not scrap the layout. I'm really surprised when I see great masterpieces, great layouts, after a lifetime of working on them, just basically unceremoniously just destroyed. So I've built this into five major modules, each about two foot eight by about 20 feet. And they're um, self-supporting, including the scenery. And uh, they can be uh, detached easily, legs removed, detached from the walls, and lifted as a unit and actually moved out through the window that leads out to my driveway here. Probably would take about four or five people on each module because they are a little bit heavy. But I did decide I'd like to do that. On the other hand, we're probably not going to move and it's going to be here for a long time to come. Hopefully I'll be here for a long time to come. So um, that is sort of faded, but uh, I like the idea though that uh, it might, might not have to be destroyed. And I've got this set up such that I could do a lot of operations on the layout, but what I really enjoy more is just running trains and building scenery and creating a, my own separate world down here. And the part I think I like the least is, elect is uh, electrical work. If you look under my layout, uh, well, I don't want you to look under my layout. It's just a mess down there, the electrical work. Um, if anyone wants to help me with fill, build phase two, the electrical work, I'm more than happy to have you join me. 
The track is all prefabbed Shinohara Walther's uh, switches and uh, tortoise uh, controls. Code 83 on the main line and it's code 70 in all the yards and sidings. This is actually my first finished layout. I've started a couple of layouts before, once when I was 12, once when I was in my 30s. I didn't get very far in either one, so this is basically my first real layout. And it's taken me this long to get this far because uh, I've been learning on the job. So, having said that, why don't we get started with a visual overview um, and tour of the layout. We'll begin our journey here in Chatham. Today, uh, Chatham remains a charming and busy village, but at mid-20th century it was bustling with the sights, sounds, and smells of major railroad activity. The Rutland Road's corkscrew division terminated here where they forwarded Vermont's milk and dairy shipments to New York City via the New York Central's Harlem division, which also terminated here at Chatham. In addition, several passenger trains arrived via the Harlem division on their way to North Adams, Pittsfield, and other Berkshire destinations. Both the Rutland and Harlem division had modestly sized yard and engine facilities in Chatham, which I plan to develop in phase two. Built in the 1890s, Chatham Union Station is on a list of National Historic Buildings and currently serves as headquarters for a local bank. My scratch-built model is about 90% full size and Tower 65 is directly across from the station. I have photos from 1930s that show these prototypes. As an architect, I really enjoy creating urban scenery and Chatham is one of my favorite subjects. I used a variety of kitbashed structures to produce a reasonably close representation of Main Street Chatham. The 19th century firehouse bell tower remains to this day a prominent Chatham landmark. Departing Chatham, the B&A follows Stony Kill Creek through farm and dairy country until reaching the little village of Canaan, New York. By mid-20th century, Canaan was merely a flag stop for almost all passenger trains. But in the early 1900s, Canaan warranted this handsome stone station. It was one of more than 20 that the B&A had designed by nationally renowned architect H. H. Richardson and his followers. Tunnels were almost non-existent on the famed water level route. These two state line tunnels were the only ones on the Boston and Albany. The first bore was completed in the 1840s and then supplemented a few decades later by a larger second bore which today handles double stack trains. Until World War II, the small shack at the entrance provided shelter for a tunnel inspector who checked for fallen rocks and ice problems during the winter months. These tunnels were favorite locations for B&A photographers. Leaving the state line tunnels, we soon arrive at the New York, Massachusetts state line. A minor B&A flag and water stop, state line is where the New York, New Haven and Hartford Railroad exchanged freight from their Danbury branch with the New York Central.
You can see the New Haven line disappearing into the trees behind the station, where I have a two-track staging area. The State Line Dairyman's Cooperative and Ice House complete the scene. Most of the scenery on the western portion of the, of the Boston and Albany is pleasant rolling farmland and gentle hills. But it's not all that spectacular or what comes to mind when remembering the B&A. So, I decided to take an artist slash architect's license and fudge the scenery. Just east of State Line and just west of Pittsfield was a sort of mini summit. Well, I've taken the liberty of substituting the, the gorgeous scenery near Washington Summit east of Pittsfield with the unremarkable Pittsfield Summit just west. In this scene, we're looking at the very photogenic location of the twin ledges that occur near Washington Summit. You may have noticed the dense hardwood forest cover that blankets the Berkshires. Well, so far I've completed about 4,000, quote, super trees. It's a tedious process, however I do it in many small batches over an extended time period, and with the TV nearby. But I do think the results are worth the effort. A key aspect of my decision to incorporate the scenery near Washington Summit is the inclusion of the Westfield River. This river is a prominent feature of western Massachusetts and is integral to BNA imagery. The BNA mainline crosses it multiple times, often on classic stone bridges and viaducts which were already a century old by mid-20th century. When I came in New York, Richmond, Massachusetts was just a flag stop for most of its existence. With almost no 20th century images to go by, I did my best trying to represent this little town. Approaching Pittsfield, we come across one of the B&A's smaller customers. The interlocking tower just beyond Superior Building Supply marks where the New Haven's passenger line joins the B&A into Pittsfield. This New Haven line also hosted year-round service for New Yorkers yearning for escapes to the Berkshires. In the background here, we see a small representation of the gigantic General Electric Pittsfield complex. These two buildings and sidings are just a minor stand-ins for the mile-long complex that was a major source of B&A traffic and revenue. In the foreground, we see modest engine servicing facilities and a small yard. B&A had no such facilities in Pittsfield, but the New Haven did. Well, I just couldn't help myself. I thought they looked great and would be perfect way to display motive power. So I decided that on my version of the BNA, these facilities actually belonged to the BNA. Just one of many compromises with reality that I'm happy to admit to. Welcome to downtown Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Here you can see more of my love for urban scenery. This is a view down North Street, and all the buildings shown are fairly close approximations of those in the early 1950s. Today, some, such as the Palace Theater, are gone, but many others live on. England Brothers Department Store is gone, but it's been replaced with an office building of almost identical size, height, and dimensions. Sadly, the B&A Freight House and Pittsfield's spectacular Union Station are also gone, but they live on in my basement. The B&A Freight House is modeled from both Atlas and design preservation components, combined with some scratch building. Pittsfield Union Station was created by a major kit bash of two Walther's power plants, combined with dollhouse components and some scratch building. I was delighted when a visiting fellow a modeler from Pittsfield reminisced about walking the streets I've recreated and pointing out where he learned to drive a stick shift. Almost all my structures have lighting and several have interiors. As I mentioned earlier, I've strayed from total BNA historical accuracy. But after all, what New York Central fan could resist running a few Niagara's or Streamline Hudson's even though they never ran a mile in the BNA? 
You may have noticed this previously, and you can also see it again here in Pittsfield. The engine you just saw pull up to the water column here in uh, Pittsfield is probably my favorite. It's a beautiful division point model. It's the classic Boston Albany Berkshire, first created in the 1920s. This is 1442. has a, a Hudson tender with it, which it was equipped with uh, in the late 40s, as uh, some of the Hudson's tenders were replaced by PT tenders on New York Central. They were moved down to the um, B&A. I have several B&A beautiful models, such as this um, uh, J2C Hudson here with the extra large sand dome for trying to conquer the Berkshire Hills and their grades. Even though you probably saw a lot of uh, Niagara movement today, I love Niagara's too. And even though they never set one wheel on the B&A, it's my, my railroad and I love them and I run them as well as I run some uh, streamlined Hudsons. I even have the Empire State Express running along here every now and then. Anyway, as I worked on this more and more, the B&A, I started to realize that I love everything New York Central, and the B&A is wonderful, but who wouldn't want to have these types of engines uh, running on your layout, whether it's B&A or New York Central? So um, that's one of the compromises I'm happy to admit to and feel really good about. Well, we've reached the end of our tour today of the Boston and Albany. I've had a ball building this, and uh, I've enjoyed sharing it with you. And thank you for watching.